not scream when the terror is so sudden. There's no time to scream. Meet the Press honors Hubert H. Humphrey. Sunday morning at 11.30 on NBC 11. The following special anniversary edition of Meet the Press was originally scheduled for presentation in November. It was postponed because of events in Iran and Afghanistan. This is Bill Monroe inviting you to join us for a special 32nd anniversary edition of Meet the Press. Three decades ago, Meet the Press announced itself with rhetorical ruffles and flourishes. Here on film is the opening of the program for February 20, 1949, featuring a brand new United States Senator. It's the roar of the presses. Working day and night in the north, south, east, and west of our nation, these daily presses pour out over 48 million newspapers. And behind these millions of headlines are the country's ace reporters, men and women who bring you the inside story. Tonight, the makers of Maxwell House Coffee bring you America's press conference of the air, Meet the Press, where you'll meet top newsmen in an unrehearsed, spontaneous press conference with one of the outstanding personalities in today's news, Senator Hubert H. Humphrey. That's how Hubert Humphrey was introduced on his first Meet the Press appearance more than 30 years ago. Today on this special anniversary program, our guest in retrospect is Hubert H. Humphrey. Meet the Press is brought to you today by United Technologies Corporation. Some words about technology. When you say the word technology to most people, they usually think of some complex, dehumanized machine. But that's wrong. Technology is anything people use that makes their lives easier. Now, most people feel comfortable with the technology of their grandfathers, like this plane. But many people feel uneasy with the technology of their grandsons. One reason for this is that people like to feel any problem can be solved once and for all. But technology has solved the problem of heating our homes at least three times, by the fireplace, the wood stove, and finally, by the furnace. Each solution solved the problem until life changed. Now we have to solve the problem all over again. And we will, but not just by technology. We'll solve it by the advance of technology. Because technology is a continuing response to the needs of life. We're United Technologies. Meet the Press has just completed 32 years on television. Today, to mark the occasion, we will look into a rich new historical resource, television, film, and tape. None of us can know what George Washington sounded like, how Benjamin Franklin smiled, or the effect of Abraham Lincoln's physical presence. They are museum figures, cold and silent. But future Americans will be able to gauge the living personalities of American presidents and legislative giants, see them campaigning, listen to their speeches, watch them answer the questions of reporters. From the files of Meet the Press, our focus today is on Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota, who was at the center of American politics for a quarter of a century. He died almost two years ago, but he still holds the record of 25 appearances on Meet the Press. On February 20, 1949, Hubert Humphrey, the former mayor of Minneapolis and a U.S. senator for just seven weeks, first appeared on Meet the Press. He quickly made it clear he believed in using federal taxes and government programs to help people. Uh, Senator, would you give us a brief summary of the uh, social legislation you expect this Congress to uh, pass? Yes, I, uh, the, what I really feel that we can accomplish. Uh, federal aid to education, I'm sure that we'll pass the Federal Aid Education Bill. We'll pass the National Science Foundation Bill. Uh, we'll increase the minimum wages. Uh, we'll extend the coverage and the increase the benefits of Social Security. Uh, there will be, that of course includes old age pensions. Uh, there will be, likewise, legislation in the field of health, the uh, uh, a broad national health program. Senator, what I want to know is, is, is there anyone among you uh, Democratic uh, progressives who is interested in keeping the cost of government down instead of increasing it all the time? I am definitely interested in economy and government. And economy and government, to me, does not necessarily mean spending little. It means spending what you have and spending it well, just as economy in a home doesn't necessarily mean spending a little. 
a healthful child that grows healthy into healthful manhood or womanhood is a much more productive citizen and will increase his productivity as he goes into the areas of industry. And a soil that's taken care of, sir, is a much more productive soil. Now, that isn't a, that is an expenditure of money in terms of what you call extravagance. That is an investment. This is an investment in the future and the present day of America. Uh, that idea you had of bailing out Midwestern uh, landlords who were throwing people on the street by buying them up. Well, well uh, I would agree that that isn't such a practical idea. I would say that isn't such a practical idea, but it's a lot more practical than permitting people to be evicted. And if I have the choice between the expenditure of a few millions of dollars of the federal government money and seeing the people put out in the streets and no place to live, you're going to find Hubert Humphrey voting for the expenditure of the money. My money. Your money and my money. I, I hope that you pay a little bit more than I do, but I'm not sure. That 1949 debut of Hubert Humphrey on Meet the Press originated in New York. The reporters, all representing New York newspapers, were introduced with a deference today's journalists might find quaint, and the senator showed discomfiture at the mishandling of his middle initial. Mr. Lister is a well-known reporter on the New York Times. And here is Mr. C. Norman Stabler, distinguished newsman on the New York Herald Tribune. Noted among the gentlemen of the press is Mr. Glenn Neville, executive director of the New York Daily Mirror. And another important newsman here tonight is Mr. Murray Davis of the New York World Telegram. And here's our guest, Democratic Senator Hubert S. Humphrey from Minnesota. We'll be back in a moment with more highlights from Hubert H. Humphrey on Meet the Press. Because the wine remembers, the bottle maker creates a special color in the glass, enabling the bottle to shield our sensitive wine from the light's harmful rays. Here at the winery of Ernest and Julio Gallo, for our crisp Chenin Blanc, the eye of the bottle maker is as critical as that of the winemaker. Every step we take, we take with care, because the wine remembers. The IDS difference, ideas, money ideas from a nearby IDS representative. Great many ideas, really, to make your plan as special and as individual as you are. You see, some people can offer you only investments, or only savings plans or insurance. But with over 40 proven financial services, we can be objective about what's really best for you. The IDS difference. Ideas to help people manage money. Our guest in retrospect on this 32nd anniversary edition of Meet the Press, Hubert H. Humphrey. You'll note that most of the highlights from Senator Humphrey's 25 appearances on this program are in black and white. Meet the Press did not begin appearing regularly in color until 1960. Even after that, for nine years, file copies were kept in black and white. In 1948, Hubert Humphrey's ringing oratory had galvanized the Democratic Convention into adopting a civil rights plank so tough that many Southern Democrats walked out. By February of 49, a freshman senator, Humphrey was pushing a bill against job discrimination. If you force that on the Southern states as a federal act rather than letting the states themselves determine it what's going to happen to your democratic majority in congress well now i'll tell you i i'm one of those persons that doesn't believe that a political party ought to just be a rallying ground for anybody that wants to get under the tent i'm of the opinion that a political party ought to stand for something the democratic party in philadelphia in 1948 adopted a platform that's the platform of the party we had some people who gathered together in another city to adopt a new set of political principles. They called themselves Dixiecrats. And we went out and had an election. We had four political parties. We had the Wallaceite Progressives. We had the Republican Party, the Dixiecrats, and the Democrats. And uh, I'm of the opinion that the Democratic Party won an overwhelming victory on November 2nd with all the trouble and all the fanfare that went with it. Looked on at first as a maverick, Humphrey wound up a legislative leader, not only in civil rights, but in foreign policy. In 1956, President Eisenhower had just startled the world by forcing the French and British to call off their attempt to seize the Suez Canal from Egypt. Humphrey saw it as an opportunity. I think the United States finds itself today in the Middle East in a very fortunate situation in this sense that at long last we've gained a certain amount of respect and uh, uh, popularity with the Arab states. Therefore, I suggest that immediately the President of the United States, who is popular at home and popular abroad, respected in America and respected abroad, use his power, his influence, 
use the prestige of the office of President of the United States to call upon the government of Israel and the governments of the Arab states at once to sit down and start to negotiate their differences. Those differences, number one, are boundary differences. Number two, the resettlement of the Arab refugees. And number three, making, the, making it positively clear that every national state's jurisdiction will be respected. No expansionism, no aggression. In 1958, Nikita Khrushchev was threatening to cut off the free world's highway access to West Berlin. Humphrey went to Moscow and had an eight-hour conversation with Khrushchev. Returning home, he was questioned about Berlin by Lawrence E. Spivak, the man who stamped his character on Meet the Press. Does that mean that you would be prepared, if necessary, to use force to stay there? I think that the American people have to make up their mind that they're living in a tough world. I don't believe force will be necessary. But I do feel that Mr. Khrushchev would like nothing better than to seal off this city and literally to blot it out of existence because it is an oasis in a desert of totalitarianism. It's a haven for, refuge, uh, for refugees. And it is, as you know, the capital of United Germany. And I don't think we can afford to compromise this away a bit. Year after year, Humphrey warned about the urgency of getting nuclear weapons under control. I happen to believe that a non-proliferation treaty, that is a non-proliferation nuclear agreement, is at the highest levels today of uh, statesmanship and of diplomacy. I believe that the recent, uh, the recent explosion, nuclear detonation in China was a warning bell to humanity that we better get busy and put aside lesser dis uh, disagreements and try to find a way and a means of uh, ending this nuclear arms race before a dozen or a half a dozen more nations become members of the nuclear club, wasting their resources, gaining nuclear weapons, uh, each time uh, uh, aggravating the possibility or extending the possibility of some miscalculation or which could bring on a nuclear holocaust. Although Hubert Humphrey entered the Senate scrapping for civil rights, for 15 years he lost out the filibusters. Not until 1964 was Congress ready for major civil rights legislation. By then, the Senator's arguments for civil rights had taken on a mellower tone. Now, Negroes are demanding quotas of employment. Uh, do you approve of quotas in employment? I approve of non-discrimination in employment. I, that's why I think that the answer to this quota problem, Mrs. Craig, is the Fair Employment Practices provision, particularly as it's written in the House bill. By the way, I was looking this House bill over just yesterday, and then I went back and looked over the proposal that was offered in the Senate in 1949 by the late Senator Robert Taft. It's almost identical. Almost identical. And this, uh, I, I say this because so many people, in speaking of this civil rights bill, uh, presume that it's gone way off into the wild blue yonder, radical, far-reaching schemes. To the contrary, we mentioned a moment ago public accommodations. For goodness sakes, 32 states already have public accommodations laws stronger than in this bill. The common law of England, prior to Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, provided, for example, that there should be no discrimination on the part of an innkeeper in terms of his guests. Uh, we're, we're really just trying to catch up with old Chaucer. Humphrey's hopes were high for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which set up enforcement machinery for equality in voting rights, hotels, restaurants, public schools, and jobs. I think that if this bill is passed, Mr. Kaplow, it will be looked upon as the greatest achievement in the field of human rights since the Emancipation Proclamation. It will mean that we have eliminated, by law, the citizenship gap in this country. The citizenship gap that has weakened America for better than a century, yes, for two centuries. And I am not worried of what its effects will be, except that it'll be good. Humphrey beat a 57-day filibuster to pass that 64 Civil Rights Act. Two months later, on the eve of the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, he was hoping President Lyndon Johnson would ask him to run for vice president. When Ray Shearer asked him about the vice president's role, he produced an extravagant pledge of loyalty. I summarize it by saying a vice president will be and is what the president wants him to be. And above all, a vice president must be loyal. He must have a quality of fidelity, a willingness to literally give himself to his president, to be what the president wants him to be, a loyal, faithful friend and servant. For four years, Humphrey agonized as vice president. He twice expressed misgivings about Vietnam within the administration. 
but publicly he gave himself to Lyndon Johnson and the war. We didn't start this struggle. We did not aggress against North Vietnam. We did not send our bombers, sir, against North Vietnam until full regiments of the North Vietnamese forces were in the South, until it was recognized in every chancellery and every embassy around the world that the North Vietnamese had committed an act of aggression. Now, any time that the North Vietnamese, sir, wish to come to a conference table, Mr. Lash, and if anybody knows how they can get them there, we've tried every way we know. We're prepared to talk about every single subject that can be conceived by the mind of man. We are, in a, in a sense, moving on a premeditated, preconceived plan, week by week and month by month. We are on the offensive, and that plan includes not merely military successes. It includes, if you please, the, the holding of the areas that have been cleaned of the Viet Cong. Running for president against Richard Nixon in 1968, Humphrey voiced classic liberal themes, a Marshall Plan for the cities, daycare centers, food for the hungry. But Vietnam dogged the Humphrey campaign. He had not resolved the dilemma of how to get out of the war without losing to Hanoi. I will do everything that's within the possibilities of the protection of our forces in the field in Vietnam. And we'll do everything that's possible in the name of common sense to find an accommodation between ourselves and North Vietnam at that peace table. But I do not believe the American people want the next president of the United States to either unilaterally withdraw or to leave our forces subject to unlimited punishment from the North or in any way to sac make, uh, make adjustments or political concessions that would make the sacrifices that we made in the past seem meaningless. Despite a campaign that was steadily turning the tide, Humphrey lost to Nixon by a painfully close margin. The defeat stung him. But four years later, with the guns still cracking in Vietnam, he was back again for one last try at the Democratic nomination. He talked more urgently, but not very specifically, about getting out of the Vietnam War. We have bled and we have sacrificed for better than 10 years in South Vietnam. We have actually been involved in that part of the world since 1954. We have contributed 55,000 dead, 300,000 casualties, $200 billion in resources. No ally has ever done so much for so few over such a long extended period of time. And I do believe that if you're president of the United States, the time comes when you must make the decision, which may take as much courage to make the decision to get out as it did make the decision to get in. Senator Humphrey, will you concede that if Senator McGovern wins that California credentials fight, your chances of getting the nomination are dead? No, not dead. No, no, no. I haven't forgotten that I came within less than 1% of defeating Richard Nixon against almost insuperable odds. I can defeat Richard Nixon. I can put the coalition together that can do it. I can take him on on the issues where he's vulnerable, on the economic and social issues of this country. And I do not want Richard Nixon to have four more years in the presidency where he doesn't have to face the challenge of re-election. The Democrats rejected Humphrey in favor of McGovern, as eight years earlier they had rejected him for Kennedy. But in the mid-70s, Humphrey enjoyed the status of senatorial elder statesman. On Meet the Press, he seemed uncomfortable with school busing and outraged at the high interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve Board. But, Senator, do you not consider busing as the only available way to, in, uh, to enable school integration in many areas and therefore support it in many areas? My friend, if it, is, if it is to be used to improve the quality of education as a temporary measure, it has validity and it should be used. And it isn't as if you, you back away from it. I'm simply <laughs> saying that massive busing as the answer is not the answer. Unless this three-legged stool of the American economy Congress, the White House, and the Federal Reserve Board is in balance. Somebody's going to fall on a certain part of their anatomy. And you know what I mean. That short leg of the Federal Reserve Board has got this economy of ours in a, in a, in a tailspin. And it's time to stop it. And I use this program today to serve notice on the Federal Reserve Board that those of us in the Congress are going to see that something's done about it unless you shape up. And it's about time that the American people understood where the problem is. <coughs> You're never going to build a house, my friend, at 10% interest on mortgage money. And that's what the people are paying. Senator. In a moment, some glimpses of Hubert Humphrey, the exuberant American politician. Some words about the city. 
One of the best ways to determine the value of a major invention is to see how it affects a large city. This city, for example, was shaped by a particular invention, the elevator. And this city, London, was shaped by the absence of that same invention. Now, people who prefer London to American cities tend to criticize the skyscrapers that the elevator has made possible. But people anywhere need a place to live and work. That's reality. So in London, we see the same skyscrapers. Only here, they're lying flat on their sides, using up land and creating vast distances between work and home. The Otis elevators we make carry the equivalent of the world's population every nine days. And the amount of gasoline energy that saves is incalculable. We believe that technology is a continuing response to the needs of life. We're United Technologies. He was not destined to become President Humphrey, but in his final years, Americans seemed to recognize Hubert Humphrey as a sort of national treasure. He was, among other things, an engaging competitor. For 30 years, he played the game of politics with the same kind of feisty relish Pete Rose lavishes on baseball. Senator, I'd like a yes or no answer to this question, if I may have it. Are you available for the 1960 Democratic presidential nomination? Mr. Bell, you're not going to get a yes or no answer simply because no one has asked me but you. Thank you, sir. Oh, <laughs> Unless I heard you wrong, I think that you said that you are not a left-wing Democrat. When did this happen? On May 27, 1911, I was born that day. Well, Senator, <laughs> if you're not a left-wing Democrat, name one for me, will well, you? Well, I'm a liberal Democrat and proud of it, and more than that, I'm very happy to be a part of this administration. But you're not uh, reneging on left-wingism or liberalism, whatever Not at all. Liberalism, I, I rejoice in it, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Uh, Senator, uh, during his southern trip, uh, which I covered here the past week, Senator Goldwater seemed to be running against two main targets. One was the Supreme Court, and one was a man he kept calling Hubert Horatio. Now, I'd like for you to uh, tell us wh uh, how much of an issue, if any, do you regard yourself in the South? Well, Mr. Litzigore, if I can serve as the lightning rod for President uh, Lyndon Johnson in this campaign, I think I will have served a very great purpose. I, uh, I think I ought to tell uh, my good friend, Senator Goldwater, that I am not running for president. It is President Johnson that is his uh, uh, adversary in this campaign. But if he wishes to give me this friendly uh, treatment out on the hustings, I'm somewhat honored, and I'm glad that he repeats my middle name, too, because it's seldom been used, and frankly, it was my father's addition to the name. And I, I sort of like the fact that someone has thought dad in these moments. This is a long-time liberal with 100% uh, ADA voting record. You have had, and uh, you have in recent years, said some very kind things about business. Does this represent a change in your attitude? Not at all. My father was a businessman. I grew up in a business family. I had business support when I was in Minneapolis as the mayor of the city. I believe in the free enterprise system. It works better than any other. As a matter of fact, I've never found anything quite equal to it. If there was anything Humphrey detested more than seeking campaign money and coping with campaign debts, it was reporters like Robert Novak needling him about them. Senator Humphrey, it was recently announced that you are settling your massive campaign debt for president for 1972 at a rate of three or four cents on the dollar. Now, when many Americans are very, finding it very hard to settle their own personal debts at 100 cents on the dollar, and New York City is uh, on the verge of default, having to settle 100 cents on the, on the dollar, how can you rationalize your approval of an arrangement like that? Because I think there ought to be some payment made. I think we ought to pay as much as we could. And one of the reasons I don't want to run for president, Mr. Novak, is I don't want to have to answer silly questions like this anymore. Senator. I'm sick and tired of being asked about campaign debts, and everybody knows that everybody that's ever run for office has ended up with a, a deficit. Senator. And that's been the problem. Four years ago, November 1975, Humphrey was feeling particularly cheerful. He felt, mistakenly, that he had beaten cancer. He was the top Democrat in the public opinion polls. Despite that fact, he declared his independence of political ambition. Senator, you told me in 1960 that you had always dreamed of being president. Now, your first in the Gallup poll 
All over this country, political reporters like, like us are being told by politicians, if Hubert would only get into it, I'd be out for him in a moment. Why are you not running, given those two facts? Well, Mr. Apple, this, uh, what you've said, of course, is one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, to have people feel as they do. And I think it is true that they feel that way. Uh, I simply have to tell you that uh, I feel I can serve my country in the Senate. I want to be free of any ambition. I want credibility. The minute that I start moving around these Kansas campaign circuit, they're going to say, there he goes again. And he's going to be out seeking votes. I am seeking nothing. I don't want anything from you. I don't want anything from the public. I think the American people want candor, and they're going to get it. If Hubert Humphrey was a political gamesman, he was also a formidable legislator. He put across the Peace Corps, Food for Peace, the Arms Control Agency, and the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He kept coming back to favorite themes, world peace and human equality. Ten years ago, he offered this vision of the politics of the future. The politics of the future, as I see it, is whether or not on the foreign levels, on the foreign policy level, we can stop this arms race spiral and lower the level of danger in this world, reach some semblance of understanding and agreements with the Soviet Union, and also to have the United States of America no longer just to depend upon money and power as a force in this world, but rather upon understanding and policy. At the, on the domestic scene, I see the politics of what we call the poor, the race issue, and the cities. And in this, of course, are involved the young and the blacks. And unless we are able in this country to make this system work so that those who are deprived and needy feel that they have a share in the system, we're going to have nothing but trouble. Reporters enjoyed interviewing Humphrey. He had some of the flair of the old vaudevillians, the soft shoe artists who like to disappear behind the curtain with a Johnny tip of the hat. In fact, if you gave him a two-second opening, Humphrey could achieve the same effect on Meet the Press. This past year, there have been a record number of student revolts. A strong student protest movement has been evident in student support for the late Senator Kennedy and Senator McCarthy. Obviously, the nation's youth is dissatisfied to an extent with I'm, the way things I'm are being sorry, run. I'm sorry, gentlemen, our time is up. I'm sorry oh, to interrupt. I had a good answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bill Monroe saying goodbye one more time for Hubert Humphrey and Meet the Press. The special address to write to if you would like to comment on this program is Meet the Press, NBC, Washington, D.C., 20016. For a printed transcript of Meet the Press, send 50 cents and a stamped self-addressed envelope to Kelly Press, Box 8648, Washington, D.C., 20011.